For centuries, Buddhist monks in Tibet performed the black hat dance. It represents the triumph of good over evil, the victory of Buddhism over forces that sought to destroy it. Monks no longer perform this dance in the monasteries of Tibet. It was banned shortly after China seized control of my country. I was nine years old when I last saw Tibet. The Chinese army had surrounded our city. At nightfall, a dozen families began the two-month trek to India. Only three made it over the border alive. All I remember is being carried on my mother's back, crossing a river and being sick. The Cultural Revolution was beginning in China. Tibetan music had been labeled counter-revolutionary and banned. In India, I joined 15 other refugee children to form the Tibetan Institute of Performing Arts. Our task was to safeguard in exile all the songs and dances which were dying inside Tibet. For the last 11 years, I've lived in Canada where I teach the performing arts to the first generation of Tibetans born in exile. I'm Tibetan, but I've never seen Tibet. My world is very different from the one my parents knew. My father was a trader who traveled on horseback between Tibet and China on journeys that lasted many months. Now he's a night watchman who has raised five children in the suburbs of Montreal. I grew up listening to my father's stories of Tibet, its people, its culture, and its tragic history. For 12 centuries, Tibet was known as the Sacred Kingdom. Isolated by the vast Himalayas, my ancestors created a culture that valued spiritual growth over material progress. Buddhism was the foundation of daily life. Buddhist monasteries offered instruction in everything from medicine to metaphysics. In 1959, Plaza, the legendary home of the Dalai Lama, fell to the Chinese. 
a campaign to eradicate Tibetan culture began. Over a million Tibetans died as a result of the occupation. The Red Army destroyed the monasteries, burned the books, and shot the Lhasa Apso dogs. Thousands of Tibetans, like my parents, fled to a new life in exile. For the past 30 years, they have never forgotten the land of their birth. My parents have something that gave us something that I'm so grateful to them for, is that they love Tibet so much. They, um, they have such an unconditional love for Tibet. And I didn't want to cry because I know I couldn't talk. But uh, they, the best way they felt that we would be able to preserve our culture is by sharing their passion for Tibet, their um, love for the Tibetan people. And um, it's something that is so nice because it's something that you can't teach to people. It's something that, um, that um, you can give to someone only if you have it within yourself, and they definitely do. The basement of my Montreal home doubles as the headquarters of the Canada Tibet Committee. Because of a news blackout enforced by the Chinese, the only source of information on events inside Tibet is from refugees who have recently escaped. To get these eyewitness accounts, we plan to travel to northern India, close to the Tibetan border. The Tibetans in Tibet, they're just giving up their lives so that the Tibetan culture can survive. Since they cannot speak up, they look at us as their spokespeople, and we just can't keep our mouths shut and just watch them die. Despite the insurmountable odds, my parents never gave up hope for a free Tibet. For me, going to India is a way of continuing that legacy. My destination is Dharamsala, the heart of the refugee community and home to our political and spiritual leader, the Dalai Lama. The white silk scarves on departure symbolize their hope for my safe journey. India means many things to me. It's the land where I was born 25 years ago. It's also the country which offered safe haven to more than 100,000 Tibetan refugees. How many of the world's wealthy nations would have been so generous? Ramsala lies in the foothills of the Himalayas overlooking the Indian plain. On the far side of those peaks lies Tibet. For Tibetans who make it over the mountains, Dharamsala is a second home.
Here, I'm as close to Tibet as I've ever been. at least two months to cross the world's highest mountain range. When you've survived armed border guards, hunger and exposure, you have good reason to celebrate. Returning to Dharamsala is like coming home. When I first arrived here 32 years ago, it was just a lonely strip of road. In three decades, we have rebuilt many of the institutions destroyed inside Tibet. The monasteries, medical institute, Institute of Performing Arts, and the library. Everywhere in the village, refugees gather to tell their stories to anyone who will listen. But the problem is now in Tibet, it's absolutely black out, and people are suffering inside. So they are requesting that to help the people in Tibet. Would you explain that people have come from all over the world to do this? Mm -hmm. Yeah, we were happy to see them. And to meet. Put them on the we said, oh, we had in the heart for them. Oh, and, uh, yeah. Yeah. How their courage was a great help for us. Yeah, it's like awesome. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, but he said that they want some time to express their feelings and what they have um, suffered. One-fifth of our population has died under the occupation. This, combined with a constant influx of Chinese settlers and a strict policy of population control, amounts to a slow form of genocide. Tashi Doma is one of many Tibetan women forced to have abortions by the Chinese. Before her escape to India, she spent a year and a half in a Chinese prison. Her only crime was carrying a picture of the Dalai Lama. Mm -hmm. Tashi Doma teaches me the words to a new kind of Tibetan song a song of protest. Mm -hmm. 
It's one thing to hear about events in Tibet secondhand from a safe distance in Canada. It's another to hear them directly from the mouths of children. I asked him what he remembers from Tibet, and he says he remembers his mom and his dad. He's nine years old. He's been here only for three months. He says that um, he, I think it's a little vague. He just remembers going through the mountains and some older brother brought him through Nepal. His uh, parents were captured by the Chinese. We were taught to hit our own culture, to hit our own religion, and also hit our ancestors or hit our history. We were taught to hit foreigners. But here we were taught to love all people, all kinds of people. At present, we are protesting against the Chinese, not to the people, but the policy, the policy of um, killing so many people in Tibet. The Tibetan children's village could have easily been my home. It was established to care for thousands of orphans whose parents died during the exodus of 1959. Today, the village is filled with children who were smuggled out of Tibet by parents desperate to give them a better life. Many pregnant women risk crossing the mountains on foot so that they can safely deliver their babies in India. The mothers then return to Tibet to prevent retaliation against other family members. This video footage of a raid on a Tibetan monastery was shot by Chinese police and recently smuggled into India. China calls Tibet its western treasure house. For four decades, it has ransacked our resources to fuel the Chinese economy. China has military objectives in Tibet as well. From the roof of the world, Chinese nuclear weapons point down on the rest of Asia. Lobsang no. Jimba, a 24-year-old monk, escaped when he was sentenced to death for leading a demonstration. When Lobsang testified before the German parliament on human rights abuses in Tibet, the Chinese police arrested his parents and beat his mother to death. Tibet 
भाजा केमी छत्स खुरे नैम ने दिया वाले अने छुलु को तोलो वंजे तिन रुचा मिलो हमारे इंजा आजो छुसिंग नहीं के थोने थोपतांग के चान्या मिल पे थोने अने फैने चिरी वाले इस होता डेज़े तिन्दे सिटी मतलब सामने तंगी है इस अने थगा नंग सिंग ठजुंग के यंग चौहाजी के सामने तंग ना ठजुंग ने आला थुंगी आती ला अने खाटे सोगरे ठजुंग थों तो शेयूं के थों ने नंग बेचो ला लोट जंग सिया तं नंग बेचो तं पहुँच रिक्शुं पे न्यूम दू टू यंग यंग दू जना अने नंग बेचो खजे शिंग बेटो के पहुँच लुचूटी शिंग � Tidak, ane terjun tanpa la pukul tangkap, cik sosu tua la kek samlo tang muda cik cik cuci cik ni ada tengko ringi zaman cik bayi ni ya, kakak ya jep deh sejak lahir ya ni tang, ane lo cakap cik tong lea la cik, tinggal cik tuhui waris, tuhui cik cik. The path of non-violence is the essence of our Buddhist culture, but a growing number of Tibetans are questioning whether non-violence is a viable political strategy. This has, on the one hand, won a lot of uh, individual sympathy and support. There's tremendous appeal for non-violence and peaceful initiatives. On the other hand, I cannot help feeling that essentially we have uh, missed the point that governments do not base their foreign policy on uh, truth and uh, history and things like that. They base their policy on the basis of self-interest. On that account, I feel we were trying to sell a commodity for which there is no market. Nobody wants to buy truth. Uh, from that point of view, I think uh, essentially it's not even a question of violence and non-violence. It's a question of action and non-action. I believe without concrete action inside Tibet, uh, we cannot move the world. If we cannot move the world, we cannot move China. <laughs> From their earliest days in exile, my parents kept an altar and chanted before it each morning. During all the years of hardship, Buddhist philosophy sustained their determination and their hope. Our trip to Dharamsala coincides with Losar, the Tibetan New Year. Through a tantric ritual, the karma of the old year is transformed by flames. As they meditate on the fire, the monks pray for compassion for all sentient beings. It's a tradition for monks to make sculptures out of colored butter, like this one in honor of the Dalai Lama's Nobel Peace Prize. All of our sacred arts reflect the Buddhist belief in impermanence. As soon as the sculpture is offered, the butter will be melted down for candles. In the process, the monks acknowledge the ephemeral nature of the material world. <laughs> Buddhism is not a faith, but a philosophy aimed at developing a clear and awakened mind. The practice of Buddhist dialectics requires these nuns to debate fundamental questions of philosophy. Each time one of our great lamas dies, we are reminded of the struggle we wage to survive as a people. But for every scholar we lose, a reincarnation is found. A two-year-old boy has been identified as the reincarnation of a high lama. 
I find comfort in the cultural and spiritual continuity he represents. My family was among the thousands who followed the Dalai Lama into exile. To the outside world, he was the 23-year-old leader of an unknown country. To us, he is the reincarnation of the Buddha of compassion. Every March 10th, Tibetans commemorate the uprising against the Chinese that forced us into exile. The Dalai Lama could lead a life of seclusion. Instead, he works tirelessly for the liberation of Tibet, global disarmament, and the environment. He believes a free Tibet would be an environmental and spiritual sanctuary. The Dalai Lama has called for Tibet to become a demilitarized buffer zone between Russia, India, and China. This is the message he will bring to the West when he visits Canada in the autumn. On my last evening in Dharamsala, I want to celebrate with the most recent arrivals from Tibet. As a young girl, my mother loved the harvest celebrations in her mountain village. All night long, she would sing and dance with her older sister. She could never have imagined the life that lay ahead. <laughs> After her escape from Tibet, 
my mother wrote repeatedly to the sister she left behind. Her letters to her sister never reached their destination because the Chinese had renamed the village. In 1976, my mother was overwhelmed to learn that her only sister was still alive. My aunt's recent arrival in Canada opens a missing chapter in our family's past. It was very touching for my brothers and my sisters and myself to meet my aunt for the first time. Because she had never been out of Tibet before and it was her first contact with the West, it was like experiencing a part of Tibet in its raw form. And after having lived under oppression for so many years, we kind of expected her to be embittered towards life and uh, it, it wasn't so. She was very centered and she was very content with life. And that really touched us. That we were really impressed that she was able to come through all this hardship, still balanced psychologically, probably more so than us, have not having lived any, under any form of hardship. And she has no material desire whatsoever. She showed up from the other side of this earth with one small suitcase and she was adamant about going back with no more than what she came with. And uh, I think that a lot of her um, state of mind is a result of her religious faith. <laughs> Kibuk <laughs> Ngayal 
Ani kamba ya ngo mashimba ko sunra jicha. Ani sumula da ropa kanga ko tang anju gunra lehores, gunra le song anju kamba res ni tangi ores. Ani tangi kamba marile, arang kamba mari, arang go mari ni ma kamba marile. Ani ya chikte ma chikte de chon chon indi tuwa do dunre mig dongba nasi do chimbo ju gunra na yo. Tak dua tinggi ngosin so. Tapi tak tak malah betul sih cimbungu. Tak ngoni ngkampar sih ngdun deh tu sih. Malah kau tu detui mindo, masih kau tu muda cik yang muda cik na yang dah. My aunt postponed her departure for six months when she learned that the Dalai Lama was coming to Ottawa. From where my parents came from, it was like a six months journey on horseback to the capital. So it was a lifetime experience. It was a religious experience. It, it was like a pilgrimage. And if the only saw a glance of His Holiness, it was just a memory that they cherish for the rest of their lives. So now that we're in exile, His Holiness is so much more accessible than he would be in Tibet that uh, to my aunt, it's just totally unbelievable that she can just look at him on a screen in this little box and hear his voice. So when she saw this videotape, she was prostrating in front of the television set because to her, it was like meeting him in person. Mm -hmm. Although we informed the Prime Minister and External Affairs Department more than a year ago of the Dalai Lama's first visit to Ottawa, they've not been able to make room for him in their agendas. Potential visit of the Dalai Lama. Well, it's not potential. He is coming. You're on the Commons Committee that's invited the Dalai Lama, but Joe Clark doesn't want to give it official status. Is there a reason? Well, not only Joe Clark, the entire government. All sorts of national figures will meet the Dalai Lama, yet the government of Canada refuses to give him any kind of interview and refuses to give him any kind of security when he's here. They won't allow him to be given security by the RCMP or the armed forces. So uh, he's here virtually on his own like a tourist. I think the government's view is that they don't want to offend China and consequently they're simply giving a total cold shoulder as a government to the Dalai Lama. Thanks, Mr. Omid. We'll talk to you in a few weeks. Thank you. Bye. Bye. Warren Omid is a liberal, liberal. Normally, Nobel Peace laureates like the Dalai Lama are welcomed by the government and invited to address a joint session of parliament. The last straw was that there will not be a security provided. And that's when we thought, now we take it to the people of Canada and at least let them know what's happening. And that's, I think, it's shameful and disgusting what they're doing. I mean, they're their reasoning was uh, just unbelievable that nobody has made threat against the Dalai Lama so often. There's no need for security, but that's not the point. He's the Nobel Peace Laureate for number one, and he's a Buddhist leader, well-respected around the world, and, uh, and there's a minimum courtesy from this government that any VIP gets, and he should get. And now here we have the small Tibetan community trying to do everything in its power, pulling resources together. We don't have one full-time paid staff in Canada. They're doing everything from the security, from the limousines, everything we're doing on our own. Yeah. It straddles, because this, this one goes to six, so in other words, the audience is at seven, so in other words, you know, love saying maybe. maybe. Anyway, I'll read it to Pat over the phone and see what she thinks. Yeah. I think basically that's what she wanted, to let people know that there is a press conference 
The press but release is going to have to be translated. I put the biography. There is one audience for non-Tibetans, for which I'm now it's getting the list is getting really, really long, and we have to cut back. This unveiling ceremony that's happening on Sunday at four o'clock on Elgin Street. Yeah, 4 p.m. on Elgin Street. So that basically rules out all the afternoon interviews, so they'll be done in the office. So what I'll do is I'll stay in the office all day, and when the interview goes on, I'll just turn the ringer on the phone and leave the machine on. <laughs> what we're trying to do is we're trying to put pressure from every angle and to get some sort of recognition for the 6 million suffering Tibetans over the last 32 years that world has basically chose to ignore. In exile, a journey to the capital to see the Dalai Lama takes only a few hours on a bus. Jambo my aunt has waited for this day all her life. <laughs> <laughs> I'm a little bit uh, afraid if I speak through my own broken English, uh, you might you might get, I'd say, the inconvenience. Some people believe human nature is aggressive. I believe the real dominant force of human mind or human society. Still, in spite of all these negative events, I think the compassion and the human affection. If we look children, just like here, one small I think boy, <laughs> she show me very much I'd say warmth. And he he gives me some kind of let's say, I think I think I think I'd say the what do you call? Feeling of friendship. No 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 no. No, <laughs> no I mean I cannot you see the I mean adequate English word, but you see here you see my clothes not prepared for this cold oh, cold cl climate. So you see these people is come close. So you see, gives give me some warmth. Uh, that is good, isn't it? Is there any chance the prime minister may later in the week turn around and uh, visit with the Dalai Lama, or is that absolutely out of the question? 
Well, at this point, uh, I think it's going to be out of the question because the solace is leaving Ottawa tomorrow afternoon. So uh, there is not much time. Why do you feel Beijing is still listened to and not the Dalai Lama? Is that simply to get to the billion person Chinese market? Well, that's exactly it. Canada is willing to speak up for human rights in those countries where there is no price to pay. And obviously in China, it will be a great price to pay. How you doing? Okay, so far, so good. Canada and the other countries which rushed to liberate Kuwait have rewarded China with most favored nation trading status. We have actually a letter from External Affairs to Mr. Almond uh, uh, stressing that uh, they would make these courtesies available. You know, these, this is the minimum of the minimum, so to speak. And so I think if they can't even, let's put it this way, they're not being entirely cooperative. Our community wants to do everything it can to make the Dalai Lama feel welcome. <laughs> My mother and aunt helped to prepare Tibetan dishes for His Holiness and his entourage. In 30 years of exile, the Dalai Lama has traveled to many foreign capitals, but few heads of state have had the courage to meet him. The United Nations has been a dead end as well since China has a veto on the Security Council. As a result, the Dalai Lama has no access to the legislative bodies which could consider his peace plan for Tibet. His meeting with parliamentarians has been relegated to a back room in the West Bloc. Today, we are welcoming His Holiness the Dalai Lama on this, his first visit to the capital of our adopted home. Over the past 40 years, Tibetans have endured a military occupation of the cruelest nature, and yet the issue of Tibet has received very little attention from the international community. Canada can help by considering the situation in Tibet when it deals with China. There will be a price to pay for standing up for truth and justice. But we Tibetans are not fighting for a piece of land. We are struggling for our very survival. Please help us. The House of Commons is ringing the bells for a vote, ensuring that very few MPs are present. It gives me both pleasure and at the same time uh, <clears throat> a feeling of sadness um, and, and feeling of uh, being touched when I see on your face the great concern that you have in the fate of Tibetan people. And I would like to express my appreciation of that. I personally, you see, con consider the struggle for freedom of Tibet, not just so one small community, but I believe they, we are carrying struggle for preservation or for survival, for survival of one ancient human culture, something really useful. Every single human being have responsibility to think, right, to concern about our, oh sorry, our humanity, and especially you see, coming generations. Catherine. Yes. That's, that's my own uh, This is a wonderful gesture that I appreciate very much. Thank you, sir. Your Holiness, I understand, darling member of parliament here. I certainly enjoy meeting you, you and uh, all the best in your great work. Thank you. Right. There, you just, I wanted to get a picture there. Of that. <laughs> Good. Thank you Thank very you. much. All Thank the you. best. Thank you. New Brunswick mm -hmm. He's a man I admire, and every time I see him, he gives me that extra energy to go on. 
because it's not easy what we are doing because it's uh, it's really when you think about it it's a losing battle because nobody really cares what happens to Tibetans um, but we go on and there is something in us that tells us don't give up keep going and uh, sooner or later it'll bear fruit Tibet has always been a, a part of our life. It's our upbringing. It's to see uh, how much hope our parents have in us. And also, it's the fact that all the Tibetans that are struggling in Tibet, every time they demonstrate, they do it hoping that the Tibetans and the outside the world community will care enough to do something about it that we won't just stand and watch them give away their life. So that's what really inspires me, is that I, I would find it unbearable to just watch them on the 6 o'clock news and just go back to work and pretend like nothing happened. Sina <laughs> One week after His Holiness's departure, my aunt returned to Tibet. I like to remember her dancing like she used to in the mountains of her childhood. Mm. Mikhi <laughs> For as long as I can remember, prayer flags have flown in our backyard. They remind us of our cultural roots and send blessings on the wind.
Ke pa yu re, ke pa yu re.